was Braymon. I am. I am that man. I am Derek Wilburn. I am your brother from another mother. I'm your other brother from another mother. If you're a female, you're my sister from another mister. But this is the Thursday afternoon edition of Uncle Tom Talks. Uh, I am coming to you live from Southern Colorado. However, the show is being produced back at the mothership. The voice you hear before and after mine is none other than the two-time heavyweight champion of the world, the dancing destroyer. His name is Apollo Creed. Apollo who? <laughs> Democrats have hijacked an entire holiday. That is the actually, that's the title of this show. That's actually the sub topic of the show, but I'm going to lead off with that. Martin Luther King Jr. Day, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King has a federal holiday. It was this Monday, this year, Monday, January, uh, what was it, the 17th. Um, Democrats have hijacked an entire holiday. It is absolutely unbelievable. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day is no longer a celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his life and his legacy and his untimely demise. It's now all about bashing and painting Republicans as racists. They've turned it from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day to Republicans are racist day. Uh, it's the most incredible thing. So you may have heard about Penzi, P-E-N-Z-E-Y spices. I'd never heard of Penzi spices until the other day. Uh, I actually made what the CEO of Penzi spices did one of my real fake headlines Tuesday. If you didn't see Tuesday's podcast, check the archives. Real fake headlines is the last 10 minutes or so of every show. The CEO of Penzi spices declared MLK Jr. weekend to be Republicans are racists weekend. True story. You can put it, search, search these keywords in any search engine. I prefer DuckDuckGo. Penzi, spices, Republicans are racists. Just put it in there. The CEO of a company, th this man actually has the, uh, the, the business audacity. You go broke, go woke, go broke. This man called half of his consumers, half of the country, or to be accurate, actually half of the voting electorate, racists. So you are a racist, not by your thoughts, feelings, actions, or attitudes. You are racist simply as a result of the manner by which you are registered to vote. If you are registered to vote in your state as a Republican, According to Penzi Spice's CEO, you therefore are a racist. And this clearly is the way the man feels 24-7, 365, but he took advantage of Martin Luther King Day Jr. weekend to make this proclamation and actually put a promotion on his website, save 15% or whatever, on a Republicans are racist sale or something of this effect. And this took place all around the country headlined by the current president of the, I'm going to say headlined by the current occupant of the Oval Office, but here in Colorado. So I've been going to Martin Luther King Jr. Day events for years, years, decades, and forever. Uh, me and a, and a group of conservatives, we have attended the Denver Martin Luther King Day March and celebration and stuff. It's a holiday that should belong to everyone. Last time, I, I didn't go the last couple of years, COVID has kind of screwed everything up. But the last time I was there, we marched with our banner, my 501c3 is the Rocky Mountain Black Conservatives. We marched behind our banner, dozens of us. I actually had a guy come up to me and say, why don't, you, why don't you go hold a protest somewhere? What are you doing here? I said, protest? Who would protest Dr. King? This is, a, this is a holiday for all Americans, not just liberals. In Pueblo, Colorado, just south of Colorado Springs, so Denver, Colorado Springs, Pueblo, is kind of our Colorado metroplex, so to speak. Pueblo, south of where I am, about 35, 40 miles. Good friend of mine, Jim Lutak. Jim's a white guy, big supporter of the Rocky Mountain Black Conservatives, always has, serves on my board of advisors. I don't care that he's white, what difference does that make? He believes in the organization, he believes in the mission. 
And he takes it upon himself to go to the Pueblo MLK Day celebration every year because that's just how he rolls. He wants to be there. He wants to be present. Everyone in the community knows that he's an outspoken conservative. He's an outspoken Republican. And he goes to the MLK Day celebration in Pueblo. And the mayor of Pueblo, Democrat, Pueblo's a big Democrat county, big Democrat city in our in our state, gets up, gets up there and goes off on the voting rights, how Republicans are trying to steal voting rights and suppress black voters and do all the talking points that were sent out by the DNC that you're supposed to talk about on the occasion of MLK Day. Because on MLK Day, you have collections and concentrations of blacks, and this is our opportunity to pump them full of our talking points, that Republicans hate you, that Republicans are racist, that Republicans are trying to prevent you from voting. They have hijacked a holiday. They've literally turned MLK Jr. Day into Republicans are racist day, and they have speeches and platforms and stuff in the country that do exactly that. And that is exactly what was done by the current occupant of the Oval Office. His name is Joe Biden. And Joe Biden gave yet another anti-Republican speech on the occasion of MLK Day. And I'm going to pick this apart a little bit myself, and then I'm going to give you the words of one of the most brilliant Americans alive today, and that is Senator Tim Scott. Tim Scott dismantled, used his time on the floor of the U.S. Senate yesterday or the day before yesterday, I think it was, and just dismantled uh, what Joe Biden had to, say, had to say. So Joe Biden comes out and, and does what he has done many times, labeled the efforts of Republicans or the lack of efforts of Republicans, depending upon how you want to look at it, as Jim, as the resurgence of Jim Crow. That's what he did on Monday. Now, he's done this lots of times. Earlier in the year, he said you know, he called what he called uh, the voting rights, uh, the voting, the voter bill that was passed in, at the state level in Georgia, Jim Crow on steroids. Uh, and he's if you go to YouTube and, and search on the keywords, Joe Biden, Jim Crow, you'll get all kinds of videos. I mean, he's referred to what's taking place in the country today in legislative legislatures around the states as Jim Crow many, many times. And I want to spotlight one of them before we get to his speech on Monday that I'm going to deconstruct. This is from last July. Heavyweight champion, let's start things off with cut 13. This is short. It's only 20 seconds, 25 seconds. This is the now occupant of the Oval Office. Cut 13. What I'm worried about is how un-American this whole initiative is. It's sick. It's sick. It's sick. That we'll be able to stop this because it is the most pernicious thing. This makes Jim Crow look like Jim Eagle. I mean, this is gigantic. What they're this makes Jim Crow look like Jim Eagle. What exactly? I don't even know what that means. Uh, Jim Eagle? I mean, it could just be ignorance on my part. Jim Eagle could actually be a thing, could actually be a person, could actually be, and I'm admitting that I'm ignorant. I've never heard the term Jim Eagle before, um, but this makes Jim Crow look like Jim Eagle, referring to laws passed in Georgia to protect the integrity of the vote. Now, whether you're a supporter of these laws or not isn't the issue. The issue here is the over-the-top rhetoric by a man and a party who spent four years telling us the problem in the United States is the rhetoric coming from the Oval Office, the hate, the divisiveness, that we need a uniter. We need to elect somebody who can tone it down, who can bring civility back, who can unite the country. Has Joe Biden and the Democrats done that? Have they put any effort into that whatsoever? It's worse by far than it was under Trump, in my opinion. They never stop. They're literally calling half the country racists and accusing the Republicans around the country, elected representatives at the state level, 
of trying to bring back Jim Crow. So before we get into Biden's speech and then Senator Scott's response to it, I want to read for you. These are some of the Jim Crow laws. So for those who don't know, and here's the thing, they, they get up there and say this at this speech in Pueblo that Jim Lutak, Lutak my buddy in, in, in Pueblo attended, where the mayor got up there and started going off on his Jim Crow rant. And this went on all over the country as they hijacked, hijacked a holiday. I wonder how many people listening actually know what Jim Crow really was. If it's just a, become a term that's thrown around so much these days that the ignorance level, people really don't even know. They just know that it was bad. And it was bad. The Jim Crow laws enacted in the early, uh, began in the 1880s and some of which remained in force until the 1960s. So some of you watching this video, within the span of your lifetime, Jim Crow was still in effect uh, in some places. American states and federation through Jim Crow, this is predominantly, predominantly the slave states. This, these are some of the Jim Crow laws that were on the books in Jim Crow states in the United States of America. These are actual laws. I'm reading this from nps.gov, which is the National Park Service, but you can find this information anywhere. It's not hiding. And, rem and mind you, Joe Biden and the Democrats are claiming that Republicans are trying to bring back Jim Crow. In fact, that what the Republicans are doing today, requiring you to prove that you are yourself in order to vote, is Jim Crow on steroids. This is even worse than Jim Crow. Okay, Georgia as it relates to amateur baseball, it shall be unlawful for any white amateur baseball team to play baseball on any vacant lot or baseball diamond within two blocks of a playground devoted to the Negro race. And it shall be unlawful for any amateur colored baseball team to play baseball in any vacant lot or baseball diamond within two blocks of any playground devoted to the white race. So not just you can't play baseball together, you have to be at least two blocks away. Barbers, this is again Georgia, no colored barber shall serve as a barber to white women or girls. Alabama, bathroom facilities, every employer of white or Negro males shall provide for such white or Negro males reasonable access and separate toilet facilities. Burial, we're back in Georgia. The officer in charge shall not bury or allow to be buried any colored person upon ground set apart or used for the burial of white persons. Okay, you, you can't even bury dead bodies, corpses have to be segregated. Buses. This is Alabama. All passenger stations in this state operated by any motor transportation company shall have separate waiting rooms or space and separate ticket windows for the white and colored races. Circus tickets, Louisiana, no, South Carolina, no, Louisiana. All circuses, shows, and tent exhibitions to which the attendance of more than one race is invited or expected to attend shall provide for the convenience of its patrons not less than two ticket offices with individual ticket sellers and not less than two entrances to said performance. So you can't even stand in line to buy a ticket from the same window as a white person. And I could go on and on. Um, Florida, Florida, Mississippi, Mississippi, New Mexico, Texas. I'll pick one more. Uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arizona. Let's let's do. Since I mentioned Tim Scott, let's do one from South Carolina. South Carolina. It shall be unlawful for any parent, relative, or other white person in this state to have the control or custody of any white child by right of guardianship natural or acquired or otherwise to dispose of, give or surrender such white child permanently into the custody, control, maintenance or support of a Negro. 
So in other words, if you are black, you could not adopt a white child. You could not be in custody or control of a white child. You couldn't even be maintaining a white child. So if you want to have a live-in nanny, a nanny who watches your children while you're gone to work during the day, that nanny is black and your children are white, that nanny cannot take them with her to the store to do the grocery stop shopping because that puts her in maintenance or control. Okay, so these are some of the Jim Crow laws. Again, I just, I just picked a handful. You can put, look them up and read them. But this is what Joe Biden and the Democrats say. Republicans in the country today are even worse than that. Okay, by, provide, by, by a provision that says you have to prove you are yourself. And by the way, I'd be willing to bet you that every single black person who was in Pueblo, Colorado on Monday listening to the mayor speak I bet you that every single one of them, 100%, no exceptions, all had a form of ID on their person. They had some form of identification in their wallet or in their purse, guaranteed. But this is what Joe Biden and the Democrats are claiming is Jim Crow on rights, is, is worse than Jim Crow, worse than the laws I just read to you. Okay, now. That's the setup. We are going to go now to cut number one. This is the current occupant of the Oval Office. That's what I call him. This is the current occupant of the Oval Office speaking before a crowd of black people. The same man who said, they won't put y'all back in chains. Remember that? Okay, they literally, they, they, they bring this rhetoric up. This is what they call healing the country. Uniting. Toning down the rhetoric. They're going to put you all back in chains. You know, Republicans literally want to bring back slavery and Jim Crow is what they're trying to sell. So here's a portion of his speech that Senator Tim Scott filleted, sliced, diced, and dissected on the Senate floor a couple of days ago. Let's queue up and roll cut this is cut number cut number one it's not just here in georgia last year alone 19 states not proposed but enacted 34 laws attacking voting rights there are nearly 400 additional bills republican members of state legislatures tried to pass and now Republican legislators in several states have already announced plans to escalate the onslaught this year. Their end game? To turn the will of the voters into a mere suggestion. Something states can respect or ignore. Jim Crow 2.0 is about two insidious things. Voter suppression and election subversion. It's no longer about who gets to vote. Why it's about yelling? making it harder to vote. It's about who gets to count the vote and whether your vote counts at all. It's not hyperbole. This is a fact. The fact. Look, this matters to all of us. The goal of the former president and his allies is to disenfranchise anyone who votes against them. Simple as that. Stop the yelling. facts won't matter. Your vote won't matter. They'll just decide what they want and then do it. That's the kind of power you see in totalitarian states, not in democracies. Yeah, yeah, kind of like the 2020 election. Okay, so three things. First of all, why is he, the man, somebody needs to tell the man, we give you microphones for a reason. I mean, he sounds like, like a coach at halftime with a team that, that's not putting forth much effort. Why is he yelling all the time when he's in front of microphones? Number two, Trump derangement syndrome. These people, they just can't let Trump go. He never gives a speech or a press conference without talking about Trump, the former president. You've been in office a year, man. And number three, and the overriding point of this show, what does what he just had to say have to do with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He didn't mention Dr. King's name once. They've hijacked an entire holiday. 
and made it all about Republicans are racist. They, they might as well rename the holiday. So he talks about how the, what the former president and his allies really want is a banana republic where they just control all the votes. Joe Altman and Max and, and the other conservative daily, you know, they, they do a better job of chopping that up than I can, and I don't have time to today anyway. But any, any objective observer, and granted, very few people are truly objective, including myself, but anybody who is willing to be honest, if they actually look at the matter of fact data out of the last election, just if put aside the agendas, put aside, I love Trump, I hate Trump. If, if you could get rid of all that, and you can't, but if you could get rid of all that, an objective person who would look at the matter of fact data would have to reach the conclusion there were some very, very, very strange anomalies at the very least out of the last election that swung things into, that put votes into the Biden camp. You'd have to reach that conclusion. Now, let's get on to Senator Scott. There's one more cut that I want to queue up. This is Hakeem Jeffries. Hakeem Jeffries, liberal, Democrat, black, House of Representatives. Every now and then they slip up and let the truth out. So it's interesting that Biden just ended that screed with this is how elections are run in, you know, nations that aren't democracies. Like Venezuela. Venezuela and Hugo Chavez. Uh, we all know what happened in Venezuela. It was run by a dictator. It went from a democratic republic to a socialist state, to a communist state, to us watching on the internet in horror as people are catching, killing, and eating the animals from the zoos. It just melted down. So what was the model for the voter and vote reform policies that Democrats wanted to put in place? Well, Hakeem Jeffries accidentally let this cat out of the bag. Let's queue up cut number cut number two. Hakeem Jeffries, heavyweight champ. This is only 10, 11 seconds long, but listen very, very carefully and watch his face. So he says it and he realizes what he just said. Slows down, tries to think of a way out of there. How do I and realizes it's like shooting a bullet, right? Once you've shot a bullet, it's gone forever. You can't get it back. The internet's the same way. Once you say it, it's forever. And he realizes that after what he after he says what he says. Let's roll cut number whatever I just said. Two. We're inspired Hugo Chavez, Cesar Chavez. We're, we're inspired by all of these leaders. Okay, he was talking about the, the, the bills they're putting forth. The current one they're trying to cram through and the mansion's not going to let them. Inspired by Hugo Chavez, uh, Cesar Chavez. Okay. They're taking their walking. They're, they're, they're getting their ideas from a deposed, from a communist dictator whose people ended up catching the zebras in the zoos and eating them. That's their model. So now back to Biden's speech. So Biden and the Democrats hijack Martin Luther King Day. Happened all over the country, happened here in Colorado, happened wherever you are. If you have liberals in positions of elected office, they're the ones that speak at the MLK Day celebrations. They don't even invite Republicans. Even if you have Republican senators in your state, if you had an MLK Day celebration, chances of your senator, your Republican senator, having been invited to come and address the audience from the platform, pretty close to zero. It'd be interesting to find out if Tim Scott received one of those invitations. I'm going to have to ask him. So I'm going to roll Tim Scott's response and I'm just going to let it play uh, rather than me interjecting and cutting him off and giving you my thoughts and what have you. That's inappropriate because he doesn't need it. If you didn't hear his speech from the Senate floor yesterday, day before yesterday, whatever it was, it's brilliant. It's about eight or nine minutes. I'm just going to play it in its entirety. But first, I want to give some props to Senator Scott. Tim Scott is the real deal. Tim Scott's legit. Tim Scott is, is 
he isn't one of these people where he's on when the cameras are rolling and he's somebody else when they're not. A lot of those phonies like that in Washington, D.C. But I know Tim Scott. We aren't buddies. We aren't pals. We don't hang around. But um, we spent time together because he is very, very generous with his time when it comes to my internship program. So if you don't know, I run a program called the POC, People of Color, POC Capital Interns. My organization, my nonprofit, recruits. We're doing this as we speak. We're doing interviews daily. Right now, we recruit young Black American college students from all across the country, many of them from HBCUs, and send them to Washington, D.C. to work in Republican legislative offices, to work with conservatives, to work in think tanks. We'll place them anywhere. To work on tearing down the wall, not to convert anybody, but to say, look, you know, we, we've got to end this war between Blacks and conservatives. We have to end it. So we send them and they work in conservative offices and they have a time of their lives. And Tim Scott has been so generous with his time. Not only has he hosted our, our interns, but he gives of his personal time to meet with them privately and to his passion for the mission and why he became a leader. And uh, he's just legitimate. He's who you see is who you get. So I want to show you, um, heavyweight champ, let's put up image number four. In fact, we'll just scroll through this. So here's Tim Scott, Senator Scott, speaking to some of our interns at an event we had at Freedom Works. Adam Brandon and Freedom Works does tremendous work. And this is a day Senator Scott had to actually be back in district. He had to catch a flight back to South Carolina on the same day as our event. But he had committed to be there. He said, you know what, I'll be there. Um, he had to catch a, a red eye flight back to South Carolina, probably had to get up in the morning, first thing in the morning, brush his teeth, put on a tie, shave his head, not comb his hair, <laughs> and get to some event in South Carolina. But he made time. So he came over and spoke with us. Uh, the, the interns just loved this guy. They're like, he's not what I expected at all uh, from listening to CNN and MSNBC. Uh, let's go with, with, with image number five. So he comes over, he speaks with our interns, he plays Q&A, he answers their questions. Uh, this is you know, He's listening to one of our interns asking him a question. If you look carefully over his left elbow, you see me sitting there and looking down. It looks like I'm checking my phone, trying to act like I'm paying attention. Um, let's go to image number six. So this is what the room looks like. So these are our interns. This is just a, this is a bunch of our interns who are in Washington, D.C. for the summer. They work from early June until late July. Uh, let's keep on going, Champ. Let's go ahead, image number seven. And Senator Scott, just uh, there he is posing with, with our group right there. And he's just so generous with his time. He understands the importance of reaching the next generation. And let's do one more. Let's go image number... Um, Let's do number nine. And this is a private meeting with Senator Scott. So he's a big Clemson guy, obviously, South Carolina. Uh, meets with our interns in his office, took an hour out of his time. These people are busy. Takes an hour of his day to sit and talk with our interns, most of whom are liberals themselves. And they're 19-year-old college kids. They're all liberals at this point, uh, with the exception of a handful. But that's the type of guy Tim Scott is. So when I say I know Tim Scott, this is the capacity in which I know him. He takes time out of his day, comes over, and invests it into our program, which is investing it into the future leaders of our country. So Tim Scott took to the floor. That's how I know him. That's, he took to the floor. Oh, you know what? Uh, heavyweight champ, can you put up the POCC interns uh, website real quick? You got that queued up? So here's our website. If you don't know what I'm talking about, if you just heard me mention the internship program that I run for the first time, you don't have any idea what I'm talking about. POCCinterns.com. Later, after this podcast, go and surf this website. This is what we do. Okay, this is what we do. We recruit college-age black kids from all around the country and send them to work in Washington, D.C. in paid internships. These are paid positions. We pay them. We pay their airfare to and from. We pay their summer housing on top of that. So these are typically 
internships that go to children of privilege. I mean, let's face it, most of these internships are going to kids from Yale and Princeton and Harvard and, and Dartmouth and Stanford and what have you, whose mom and dad can afford to stroke a check. Because living in Washington, D.C. for a couple months is expensive. I mean, it's very cost prohibitive for most kids who are just skating by. So we've had them from the University of California system. We've had them from Arizona State. We've had them from St. John's in New York City. We've had them from Howard. We've had them literally from all around the country. And right now we're recruiting the next class. They will show up on June 6th and go to work, working in legislative offices on Capitol Hill until the end of July. That's what we do. Visit that website to check it out. Tim Scott is a tremendous supporter. If you ever get to see this podcast, Senator Scott, thank you for the love. Uh, can't tell you how much respect you have uh, for me and from my organization. Okay, so speaking of respect for Senator Scott, cut number three is his reaction on the Senate floor a couple of days ago to Joe Biden's hijacking of MLK Jr. Day and specifically to Joe Biden's criticism of the Georgia, Georgia voting rights and some of the others asked Ray, that uh, they are trying to paint as racist Republican efforts to keep blacks from voting. If you haven't seen it, I'm gonna not do Senator Scott a disservice uh, and, and give my commentary. It's about eight or nine minutes, roll it. We're from South Carolina. Thank you, Madam President, for the opportunity to talk about something really important to all Americans, but specifically important to Americans from the Deep South who happen to look like me. As I listened to the President talk about the importance of stopping what he characterized as Jim Crow 2.0, I felt frustration and irritation rising in my souls. As I keep hearing the references to Jim Crow, I asked myself how many Americans understand what Jim Crow was. I am so thankful, thankful that we are not living in those days. But just for those who don't appreciate the Jim Crow that was, it was a time when my grandfather, born in 1921, would have experienced that if he was still alive. He could tell the stories of the Jim Crow South and the Jim Crow era, an era where in order for a black person to vote, you had to pass a literacy test. Now, if you could read at that point, it would not just be a test on whether or not you could read. It would be a test on, do you know who your governor was 20 years before you were getting ready to vote? It would include the threat of being lynched, literally killed, because those in power wanted to stop black folks from realizing and fully participating in the greatest nation on earth and exercising what I believe is a fundamental responsibility and right of Americans, the right to vote. It would include beatings and the power of intimidation, the loss of your job if you dared to show up to vote. And so when I hear my president and your president, our president of these United States just a little while ago, a week or so ago, talk about Jim Crow 2.0 and using as the poster child of this new Jim Crow South being the Georgia voting law. I rushed to read the law one more time so that I could understand what in the world is he talking about? Now, uh, I'm here this morning, this afternoon, because I had a conversation with the South Carolina in AACP about two hours ago. And they encouraged me to come to the floor and make my comments as public as possible so that people understand what I have read in the Georgia law and compare it to the Jim Crow South. So what we know about the Georgia law, and I've read the law, what we know about the Georgia law is the controversy that the president spoke about and that we heard members of Congress speak about over the weekend is it is illegal to get water while waiting to vote. Now that claim has been proven false. It is not illegal to get water while waiting in line. That is false. The only time you can't get water while waiting in line to vote, according to the Georgia law, is if there's a partisan, someone, 
campaigning for someone, campaigning for someone, you can't bring them water. But if you are an election worker or a relative, you can, of course, bring the person water. So that was completely false. But if that is the threshold of the new Jim Crow era, it looks nothing like the past. However, even that is false. Uh, what else is in that Georgia law that is the, supposedly the poster child of voter suppression? It allows for early voting to include now the souls to the polls where you have Sundays where you can vote early. As a matter of fact, 17 days of early voting, more early voting than the president's own home state or New York. It allows for mail-in ballots without an excuse. The same thing that was turned down by the voters in New York. No excuse on demand. Mail-in ballots is now the law in Georgia. New drop boxes. That pre-pandemic, there was, it was not legal to have a drop box in Georgia. Now it is legal to have a drop box in Georgia. And voter ID supported by at least 60% of African Americans, 60% of Hispanics, 60% or more of the majority population. After going through point by point and realizing in South Carolina the minority turnout was stronger than the overall turnout in South Carolina, and two of the three African American senators in the United States Senate today, two of us, represent those southern states, it's hard to deny progress when two out of three come from the southern states that people say are the places where African American, African American votes are being suppressed. Not to Amen. mention the fact that 2020 was a banner year for minority participation and the greatest nation on earth from a voting perspective. And that is, my friends, good news. The Democrats' proposal would allow for the supporters of Bernie Sanders and their tax dollars to go into my re-election account. I oppose that. It would undermine Voter ID laws across our country, I oppose that. It puts unaccountable bureaucrats in charge of our elections. Americans oppose that. And walking in on the day of the election, registering to vote without any verification is something I too oppose. And so, Madam President, when I think about the important issue of voting and when I think about the issue of voter, voter suppression, it lands on my front porch because as a guy who has voted in the Deep South all my life, as a person who was born in 1965 with a, with a mama who understands racism, discrimination, and separate and not equal, the grandfather who I took to vote and helped him cast his vote because he was unable to read. To have a conversation in a narrative that is blatantly false is offensive, not just to me or Southern Americans, but offensive to millions of Americans who fought, bled, and died for the right to vote. So if we're going to have an honest conversation about the right to vote, let's engage in that based on the facts of the laws that are being passed, not the rhetoric surrounding those laws, where it looks like power is more important than people. Boom. I'll close with this. Boom. The Civil War of this nation started in my hometown. One of the most powerful and popular senators in the history of America was Strom Thurmond. 2010, when I ran for Congress, I ran for Congress in the place where the Civil War started. And I ran for Congress in a Republican primary against the son of Strom Thurmond. 
I won that race. Not merely because of who I am, but because of who we have become as a nation. The evolution of the hearts of America and the hearts of Southerners could not be more clear on a day when the son of a single mother, mired in poverty, runs against the son of one of the most famous senators in the history of the country and comes out victorious. I would love for us to have a conversation Bingo. about what we're doing for Americans as opposed to this negative false narrative of what is happening to America. Thank you, Madam President. Huge, epic, indescribable. Tim Scott is solid. In more ways than one, I might add. Tim Scott fills up a suit, you may have noticed. That brother, I tell you, you wouldn't want to get into an arm wrestling match with Tim Scott. He's a, uh, he's legit, man. Tim Scott's probably six foot two, 215, and, and, and in the gym on a regular basis. He's, he's literally, and he's figuratively and extraordinarily intelligently solid. Uh, Tim Scott used, just used a formula that I try to stick to myself. I call it for reals. Facts, reason, evidence, logic, statistics. That's where I like to live. Facts, reason, evidence, logic, statistics. He took a purely emotional argument being put forth by the Democrats and countered it with facts, reason, evidence, logic, and statistics. Look, if the South is so racist, how do I keep getting elected? Is what he just basically said. If Republicans are so racist, how did I get elected? Republicans showed up and voted for me over the son of Strom Thurmond. And here in Colorado, the, the media ignored it, but I'm living testament to that too. I'm the former vice chairman of the Colorado State Republican Party. I ran in 2015 and won in a landslide. In a closed vote, in a vote in which only Republicans participated, this is a Republican office. And this is a very white state. Colorado is only about 3.5%. Uh, uh, six. Uh, I'm choking over my own numbers, but it's well less than the national average. So there's very few black Republicans in the Republican Party in this state. It was all white people. And there were four of us running for that office. I won. During my tenure, Daryl Glenn won the Republican primary for Senate, lost the general, won the primary. Republicans all voted for Daryl, white guy. Casper Stockham won three Republican primaries in Denver, one of the most liberal cities in the country. One of the whitest cities in the country, Republicans voted for Casper, black guy. I was succeeded in office by Sherry Gibson, black woman. Sherry served her term in office. She was succeeded in office by our current vice chair, black woman. Republicans vote for blacks all the time. Those are the facts. And Tim Scott just laid it out. This emotional, these emotional arguments designed to keep blacks on the vote farm cattle on the vote farm it's all emotion the facts of the matter is and here's something you haven't heard very many places yes the south was once the racist epicenter of america we all know that and slavery was once legal in the south but this isn't 1852 this isn't 1941 this is 2022 and the fact of the matter is the further the south gets from its Democrat racist roots, and the more Republican it becomes, the less racist it becomes. So racism was throughout the South during slavery when Democrats ran everything. Then slavery ended, emancipation happened, and then we went through, uh, then we went through Reconstruction, then we went through Jim Crow and what have you, and. The Democrat stronghold of the South began to turn into the Republican stronghold of the South, which it is to this day. And the further the South gets from its Democrat racist roots, the more Republican it becomes. It's just the opposite of what these people are trying to sell. And I loved Senator Scott and the way he just dismantled Joe Biden's ridiculous Jim Crow 2.0. And I'm going to give you a couple of more. No person, Alabama, 
no person or corporation shall require any white female nurse to nurse in wards or rooms in hospitals, either public or private, in which a Negro male is placed. Georgia, all persons licensed to conduct the business of selling beer or wine shall serve either white people exclusively or colored people exclusively and shall not sell to the two races within the same room at any time. That was once a law on the books in the state of Georgia. Now they have a law on the books in the state of Georgia that says before you vote, you have to prove that you are yourself. And Joe Biden stood in front of a crowd of black people and said that is Jim Crow 2.0. It's all emotion, and they have hijacked an American holiday. If you've been watching Uncle Tom Talks for any time at all, you now know that this show includes every with an installment of the game show that's sweeping the world. The world, not just the country anymore, it's now sweeping the world. And that is called Real Feelings. Real fake headlines is very simple. I've got four headlines I'm going to read, and we'll put up images. All you have to do is pick out the fake one. Of the four, three are real. Three, I, I went to the web and found. One, I just made it up. Use the chat room. If you can identify the fake, all you just do is just type one number into the chat. One, two, three, or four. Whichever one you think is the fake. The heavyweight champion of the world, former, will keep an eye on the chat room and he will inform me how the vote is going. And if you guess it right tonight, we are going to reimburse your tuition at the Brigham Young University campus in Hawaii. Hey, if you want to go to BYU Hawaii, the heavyweight champ's got deep pockets. He'll cover your tuition. Here we go with the real fake headlines. Heavyweight champ, you ready to go? Headline let's go. number Let's do this. Headline number 1. Nancy Pelosi's son, Paul, was involved in five companies probed by the feds as shocking pretrial connects as shocking paper trail connects him to a slew of fraudsters and convicted criminals. So Nancy Pelosi's son, Nancy Pelosi, as you know, is worth somewhere around $200 million. Her son is very wealthy, too. Nancy Pelosi's son, Paul, was involved in five companies probed by the feds as shocking paper trail connects him to a slew of fraudsters and convicted criminals. Headline number two. Michigan's Dana Nessel, and if you don't know, that is the attorney general of the state of Michigan. That is the Michigan AG. Michigan's Dana Nessel speculates white supremacy to blame for Texas synagogue terrorist attack. So you recall about a week ago, a little over a week ago, terrorist who was kicked out of Europe, uh, should never, should have been on a no-fly list, should never been allowed to fly into this country, uh, took over a synagogue in Texas and demanded that a fellow terrorist be released. Did the Michigan Attorney General blame that action on white supremacy? Headline number three, University of Hawaii profs stage walkout to protest school not recognizing smart ass as a lifestyle alternative. Okay, so listen, you, if you get this one right, you're gonna, you get tuition to BYU Hawaii campus, you may be able to attend class taught by one of these guys. They actually wanna recognize smart ass as a lifestyle alternative these people. Number four, headline number four, convicted murderers, sex traffickers received COVID-19 stimulus checks while in prison. Did that happen? Did they actually send checks to inmates in prison? Checks made up of your tax dollars and mine. So type one, two, three, or four 
in the chat. I'm going to give them to you again right now, rapid fire. We've got just about five minutes left in the show. We're going to make it. Headline number one. Nancy, uh, where'd I go? Okay, put up now. There we go. Nancy Pelosi's son, Paul, was involved in five companies probed by the Fred feds as shocking paper trail connects him to a slew of fraudsters and convicted criminals. Headline number two concerns the attorney general of the state of Michigan. Michigan's Dana Nessel speculates white supremacy is to blame for the Texas synagogue terrorist attack. Headline number three. This is dealing with professors, uh, university, University of Hawaii, very blue state. If you didn't know, Hawaii is as blue as California or New York any day. University of Hawaii profs stage walkout to protest the school not recognizing smart ass as a lifestyle alternative. Some kid probably put that down. And, okay, and headline number four, convicted murderers, sex traffickers receive COVID-19 stimulus checks while in prison. Get your votes in now. I got to speed it up. We're down to the last few minutes of the show. Get your votes in now. One, two, three, or four. Creed, do we have any votes? We have two votes for number three. Two votes for number three. Says that you cannot put down smartass on your application to the University of Hawaii. Is that it? Get your votes in in three. Two, one, that is done. It. Okay. All right. Well, here's what we're going to do. Those of you who voted for number three, I'll let the cat out of the bag early. That is the fake. It won't be fake in about another year, but it's the fake. Let's go with image number 10. Image number 10. This is from the UK Daily Mail. Nancy Pelosi's son, Paul, is uh, a shyster. He has been linked. Shocking paper trail shows Nancy Pelosi's son's connections to a host of his rule breakers and criminals. A Daily Mail investigation reveals that Paul, 52, was involved in five companies probed by federal agencies before, during, or after his time there. He was joined the board of a biofuel company after it defrauded investors, according to an a ruling. Paul was the president of an environmental investment firm that turned out to be a front to convicted fraudsters. He served as vice president of a company previously embroiled in an investigation of scams that targeted citizens. Okay, so this is the son of the current speaker of the House of Representatives. Image number 11. This should come as no surprise to anybody on the Washington Beacon, the Attorney General of the state of Michigan looked at the situation at the Texas synagogue that developed last Saturday, and Michigan's Attorney General, Democrat Dana Nessel, raised the possibility that white supremacists were behind the attack, appearing on NBC, big surprise, on Saturday afternoon, about an hour after it had been reported, the attacker was demanding the immediate release of terrorists I'm not going to pronounce her last name. Nessel said her biggest concern was that the attack was a hate crime or domestic terrorism pointing to white supremacy organizations. When in doubt, it's the white supremacists. And headline uh, image number 12. Yes, indeed. This is the efficiency of big government. The federal government, the federal government is suing. So they gave them your money and suing to get it back. The federal government is suing convicted murderers and sex traffickers who received COVID-19 stimulus checks, ordering them to use the funds to pay restitution to their victims' families. So, government, man. So they gave COVID stimulus checks to guys in prison. And now they're paying attorneys. These attorneys are billing the federal government, are billing the Department of Justice $600 an hour, $1,200 an hour, whatever. So you paid to give checks to these felons. You're paying for someone to sue to get that money out of these felons' hands and, in, and it paid into their victims' families' hands. You're paying for all of that. Big government, big efficiency, inefficiency, big fraud, big corruption, 
big government has never solved a single problem ever. This has been Uncle Tom Talks. I am Derek Wilburn. The two-time heavyweight champion of the world is going to give you the digits on where you need to like, shake, hold, caress, review to help us rise in the ratings so we can get the word out to more people because we have got to take it to the mainstream media using the new media like Conservative Daily. Heavyweight champ, what you got before we're out? Everybody, do text the word freedom to 89517 so you get our text alerts and you know when Derek is going live. Go to the link in the description. You can find him on Apple Podcasts, Podbean, and all other major podcast platforms. And give him a five-star review because we're growing this thing. He's blowing up, and we're going to help him. Make sure you subscribe to the newsletter as well. And until next time, this has been Uncle Tom Talks. Coming up right after this, we have a special interview with L. Todd Wood on Conservative Daily.